Hi and welcome back to the channel today and welcome to your December edition of Neil's Warning. In today's episode, I'll be covering a number of risks which I don't think are being covered by either the government, the media, or even some other mainstream economists. So let's start with debt levels then. This is always a good place to start. We have right now unprecedented debt levels that are just increasing and spiraling out of control currently. And I'm not just talking about government debts, although these are unprecedented. They are more than 100% of GDP, gross domestic product now. And this is an area of huge concern, especially as we're going into a liquidity trap, into this debt trap, where it's gonna be even harder to pay back these uh, debts, these loans, whilst we have record low interest rates. And I'm not just talking about debt in the Western world, I'm also talking about debt in developing nations. Some of the things I'm hearing in developing nations are absolutely shocking. Uh, I mean, I, I, I just couldn't believe some of the stories I'm hearing of these lockdowns, and again, we'll get onto lockdowns later, in these developing nations where people are not even allowed to leave their, their huts on the side of the road. People are resorting, usually the men of the family, to hunting rats in the sewers in some of these nations right now just to get food. It is absolutely just unbelievable and unprecedented what is going on. Of course, we're not hearing about any of this, but this is what's going on. If you, you start looking into it and start looking these things up, you'll find all of this information out there on the internet. And I said it's not just government debt, but it's also personal debt. Uh, I probably won't touch too much on this in this video, but we have unprecedented levels now of consumer debt, student loans, credit cards, uh, loans from the bank, mortgage uh, debt. All of these are at record levels right now as we're entering a parabolic phase of currency creation in most Western countries that have a central bank. And I'm hearing you guys, a lot of you are saying, well, if Biden or if Trump or who, whoever, I know the argument's still ongoing, whoever gets in is gonna solve this big problem for us and it'll all go away. It doesn't work like that. Money isn't created in that way. In fact, there's a lot of misunderstandings as to how currency is, is actually created. Whether you're talking about the dollar or the pound or the euro or, or whatever, there's a very big misconception. One of the things I'll mention is that central banks, although they do create the money, they're, they're not actually the originators of the money. The people that create the money or the currency, again, is not the government either. The government only taxes people. That's how they create their currency or their, their income, is through taxes. But the only institutions really that create money, but, but again, it's not money, it's currency, are commercial banks. So the commercial banks actually get the money from the central bank, like the Federal Reserve, the Bank of England, the ECB, the European Central Bank. This is where the money comes from. But it's actually the commercial banks, the ones that you'll know of, that create the money into existence via loans. So why is that a big problem at the moment then? Well, here's the reason why. These banks, especially Western banks and American banks in particular, are carrying these huge debt loads. And do the research that I've done. Have a look at the, the, the debts that these banks have taken on. And I would not touch them with a barge pole. I would not go anywhere near these, these levels of debts. So of course, what these commercial banks are doing, because they know these debts are absolutely terrible, is they are giving them to the central bank, like the Federal Reserve. And the Federal Reserve is then giving the banks new credit lines to loan against. Now, there's another reason this is a problem. And the problem is because the banks, you look at the interest rates right now, we're almost at zero in terms of interest rates. So the banks are lending money to people like yourself for mortgages, for loans, for, for whatever other purposes. And the, the loans are so risky to the bank. They're not getting much interest on it. They might get a couple of percent, uh, two, three percent, but that's incredibly risky in the situation that we're in uh, right now. So what do I think will happen? Well, it can either go one of two ways. Number one is that the banks will stop lending money. So this is a question I get asked about, should I take out a loan or a mortgage right now? 
You see, the problem is the banks may stop lending money because they, they start to see, okay, things are getting more risky. The housing market is looking not very good at the moment. So banks will probably start to reduce the amount of money that they're lending out because they see it as too much risk on their capital. And again, we can look at what happened in the Great Depression. Hey, if you're enjoying this video so far, would you do me a quick favor? Would you just click the like button below? Just helps to get the video ranked. Um, why not subscribe to the channel if you're enjoying this or maybe you're not enjoying it, but you're finding value from it. Why not subscribe? I bring you videos like this every single week. The, the roaring 20s, the banks were lending money like crazy. People were over leveraged. They were doing call options and all sorts of things to get into the stock market. Everyone was involved in the stock market. Everyone was buying real estate. But what happened when the crash came, the banks couldn't claim this money back because there was no money in circulation. Everything was just closed down. Even the banks on a daily basis were just closing, closing at an unprecedented rate. And we know this because there are diaries. I have one of the diaries here with me of what actually happened during the Great Depression. And I highly recommend that you all read some of these diaries. In fact, I can probably make a video on a couple of the best ones because People forget, you see, the media, the government, the banks, they don't tell the truth on what happened during the Great Depression. These diaries, your diaries are the best things you can ever read because they tell you an account on a day-by-day -day basis of what actually happened at the time. You know, we say right now that certain organizations are the modern book burners. And it's very true because the things I heard about the Great Depression and what I'm reading in these diaries are completely different. And I'll give you an example of this. Those of you who are keeping money in the bank, huge amounts of cash in the bank, I personally don't keep almost any cash in the bank. As soon as I get cash, I turn it into silver. Sometimes a little bit of gold, but mainly silver on allocation. I did a video about this last week if you wanna check that out. But this is what I do. Now, what happened during the Great Depression? Loads of money around, everything was fine, the banks were doing great. Well, as soon as we got into this Great Depression, the banks closed their doors. And if you wanted to take money out, you couldn't take out more than say a thousand dollars or a thousand pounds or whatever it was that you know, your currency was. You couldn't take any money out or you had to have a six week wait or they would try and shame you if you went to the bank to try and take your money out. And they would use all these psychological tactics like, oh, you should be ashamed of yourself. You know, you're gonna cripple us as a, you know, the bank and all this. No, the bank should be ashamed of themselves for making these terrible loans taking people's deposits and then loaning out 10 times what was put in as a deposit on these bad debts that they couldn't collect on. And a lot of people say to me, yeah, but Neil, you don't understand. We've now got these government insurance policies on the banks if they fail. No, ladies and gentlemen, no. They had these insurance policies. They came in during the Great Depression. Didn't make any difference. Look, let me say it to you like this. Let's say you've got whatever country you're in, you've got a quarter of a million coverage or you've got 85,000 pounds in the UK coverage or whatever coverage you've got. Do you honestly think, right, look, the governments can't even raise 100 billion. They're, you know, they're going to the central banks because they're so desperate for cash to raise all this money. You know, they're issuing all these bonds and everything else. They haven't got any savings or reserves. The governments are in massive debt. Do you really honestly, true, ask yourself this question, do you honestly believe the government is gonna come up with trillions of dollars or pounds or hundreds of trillions, right, with all these derivatives and everything else that's going on? Do you honestly believe they're gonna have these trillions to look after you and pay you if there's a massive banking collapse or your bank collapses? Get real, that's not happening. These insurance policies, these accounts anyway, you can look at this, you can look this up. You can see the data. They are less than 1% funded. The money isn't there. So this is why I'm always trying to warn people and give you this guidance. Again, people just don't take my advice. They don't take the guidance. They think I'm just scaremongering. Well, all I'll say is you'll find out for yourselves if you don't take this guidance. You'll find out the hard way. And it's the same with the stock market. It's the same with the housing market right now. Study the charts, go back and look at previous recessions, depressions, look at the charts and then layer them over the top of the charts we have right now. And you'll see very close matches. The stock market is gonna come down. The housing market is gonna have problems in certain countries. We are gonna see these crashes depending on where you are. Nothing ever just goes up and up and up forever. 
people who have this mindset, I really don't understand them. I, I just, I can't get my head around this mindset of the stock market is just going to keep going up and up and up and keep reaching record highs. The housing market is just going to keep booming. 10, 15% growth a year. That's never happened. The only time things like this have happened is before a massive crash. But again, I can only tell you what I think is going to happen. It's really up to you. If you think I'm talking nonsense, that is your decision. But I can only help and guide. Now, I do want to talk about another point which could happen and could just throw a huge spanner in the works of all of these crashes and crises that might come up. And that is what we're hearing a lot. A lot of people say it's a conspiracy theory, but now we know it's not a conspiracy theory. And that is things like the Great Reset Initiative, uh, masterminded by Professor Klaus Schwab, the founder of the World Economic Forum. So we're seeing a lot more on this now. We're seeing announcements uh, from the IMF, the International Monetary Fund, which is not a charity. As I keep saying, people keep saying to me, no, they're a charity. They go and help all these countries. Guys, do your research on the IMF, on the Bank of International Settlers, on all these other institutions. They are not charities. Look at how they get their money. Look at how they issue this money and debt. Go on to even Wikipedia, right? And you see Wikipedia is often biased. You'll even see at the bottom controversies of the IMF. And look at what's happened into the developing nations that they've gone into and they've lent money. And now they're talking about lending all this new new currency. So, I mean, I'll probably make a video on this later on. I have to be careful because um, when you make videos against huge institutions like this, they can come after you. So, so I do have to be careful with what I say. But I personally think with all of these CBDC, central bank digital currencies, we are going to have some sort of a currency war, not with guns and ammunition, but in terms of other political policies going around. Because you see, the Federal Reserve is not going to want to give up their, their position as the world reserve currency. And you have the ECB, the European Central Bank, you have China, you have other organizations like the IMF who want to take that position and create this, you know, this global currency, as it were. If the IMF gets its way and um, being helped by the World Economic Forum and all these others, guys, we are going to just see some crazy things happen. Imagine the IMF, a private institution that is, it doesn't have people who are politically elected. These people are not elected officials who are running the IMF. Okay, they look at the titles, managing director, etc. This is a for-profit organization. If they get their way and they create this, let's just say they create a, a digital currency, a cryptocurrency as it were, things are going to just be, I think they'll be very bad because it's just another step towards this one world government. And I know there's a lot of negative against it. I know there's a lot of positive. Right now, it's very hard to say what that would be like. But when you see things like tracking and chips implanted in the head and all this sort of stuff, you've got to ask yourself some questions about that. We've been warned. Let's just say there's a, there's a lot of warnings against getting these, these marks. Um, I won't say any more on that because I know some people disagree very heavily with that, but that is my belief. So let's just say, for example, that the United States or even the ECB, whoever we want to talk about here, the central bank created this CBDC, again, that central bank digital currency. I don't think that they are just going to collapse the other currency. So the US dollar that is a fiat currency. I don't think they would just collapse that. A lot of people say, well, what would the CBDC be backed by? Again, that's a, that's a tricky question because you could say, what's Bitcoin backed by, right? It's not backed by gold, for example. Would they back the new CBDC by gold? And if they did, does that mean that your gold would be confiscated? These are all big questions that we don't exactly know the exact answer to right now. But there's a possibility of anything happening. And if anyone is going to back their CBDC by gold, I would say it would be China. Because China has been buying all the, the gold reserves from around the world at a rapid rate over the last decade. And I wouldn't be surprised if they were ahead of the game, which they usually are. And they've been planning for this for a long time in order to create their CBDC, which is backed by a gold standard. I personally think a gold standard is a good thing anyway. You have some drawbacks to it. 
But at the same time, look at the fiat currency we have now. Look at the wealth disparity that it has caused in our societies, where some people, you might have five or 10 people who have more money than entire countries combined. So there are pros and cons of every strategy here. But my biggest concern with this CBDC is that once that is in place, they will track every single coin or whatever you wanna call it. They will track every single one of them and they may even put limits and policies on those coins as to what you can actually spend it on. So what happens to those of you who have been saving for decades and decades, and you've got savings in bank accounts, what would happen to that money if there was a collapse, if there was a crisis? And that is the thing that you, you really need to think about and be uh, pay very careful attention to. Make a plan. Don't just leave it there because whether you take action or not, you are still making a decision. If you take the action to remove that cash, and buy some sort of assets with it, whether it's precious metal or whether you invest it in, in some way, that is an action. The same time if you decide to do nothing and you just leave it there, and then we do have some sort of a crisis, which by the way, these crises occur every 50 to 70 years where we have collapses like this, right? You could just leave it there and then what happens if there's just this huge collapse and the banks do collapse again? I've already talked on previous videos, I don't think there'll be bailouts next time. I think a lot of it will be bail-ins. That's where the bank just takes your money over a certain amount. And then if you're like me, this camera that I'm recording this on is a very modern top of the range camera, but I also have an older camera, right? So this is the example here. The CBDC will be like my new camera. The fiat currency, your pounds or dollars in your bank account, they will be like the old camera. What do you like? What do you use? Well, as, a, as an owner, you want the CBDC. You want the new camera. That's what you're going to use. That's what you're going to promote. The old camera just loses value, value, value until it's almost worthless and the technology has gone. And I think something similar could happen to the currency that we have currently. So they could actually go side by side. They could still be operating together at the same time for a certain period of time. That is just my best guess. I actually don't know what would happen, but that is a theory I've been working on. And if you'd like to see any more of my videos as we go forward, I will be making videos on the CBDC, on the collapse of the dollar. Just make sure you're subscribed to the channel and turn that bell notification on. A lot of people haven't got the notification turned on and that's why you're not seeing my videos because when you make controversial videos like I do, a lot of the times they're just not ranked on the YouTube algorithm or whatever you wanna say and they sometimes just don't get to you. So the next thing I wanna to talk to you then about is the lockdowns that we're experiencing all over the world right now. The United Kingdom is currently in its second lockdown. This is a four week lockdown. It ends next week. I cannot wait for it to end so I can get back to at least some level of normality. But for all those people that are saying, this is a great thing, this is great for the economy, this is great for, for everything. I would say probably, I'm not gonna criticize you here, but maybe do some more research on these lockdowns. Number one, they do not stop the spread of the <clears throat> going around. I'm not even allowed to say the word anymore. They don't stop the spread, they just slow it down, which of course is a good thing. But when you look at the alternative data on this, suicides, people missing hospital appointments, the number of people dying of loneliness and other things are unprecedented right now. You have to look into this, guys. You have to take into account both sides of the coin because these lockdowns are absolutely crippling the economy. If you haven't seen my London Has Fallen video, go and watch that straight away after this video. Look at what I recorded with my own eyes, just with my camera phone. This is just crazy what's going on. Businesses are collapsing left, right and centre. And remember, this is people's livelihoods. 60% of employees are employed by small to medium sized businesses. And of course, we have all these buffoons making highly critical videos about me and my videos saying things like, oh, Neil's wrong. Next year, employment's going to come back to pre <coughs> levels and it's going to even go past that. These people are fools. I don't know where they are. They obviously don't understand the concept, which is a very basic concept called unemployment scarring. I mean, this is just economics 101. So I recommend those people go and watch that. Job losses create more job losses because the people who lose their jobs are spenders. They spend into the economy. They create the GDP. 
when they lose their jobs, they can't, GDP drops, etc., etc. I've covered it in detail on loads of other videos. I won't go into it in depth right now. But this is what happens. This is what crashes the economy. Employment is not going to boom next year. We're not going back to pre-levels <coughs> and past it. It is just not going to happen. But at the same time, am I saying we're going to have hundreds of people in line at soup kitchens every day and just hundreds of people just littering the streets? No, I'm, I'm not saying that at all. I don't think that would even happen in 2021. If we did go into a depression like we saw in the 1930s, I think we're still a couple of years, a few years off that anyway. Things would really have to take a severe downturn to get to those levels again. And even then, I don't necessarily think we would see that level of downturn simply because of technology now, um, how farming machinery is done. It's not done manually anymore like it used to be. And we just have very high efficiency and output in crops and food manufacturing. However, you have to bear in mind uh, alongside this, got to add a caveat here, certain nations are seeing huge droughts at the moment. And it's just interesting when you look back at history, how the Dust Bowl during the Great Depression, of course, many of you won't know what I'm talking about um, unless you're 90 years old. And I don't think many 90 year olds watch my channel. But during the Great Depression, there was the Dust Bowl. And this is where the, because everyone was farming at the same time, plowing their fields, it just created this huge dust, dust storm. There was a lot of problems with crops and things like that. And you know, just on that, on this point, I'm not one of these people that just talks about things and doesn't take any action or tries to help. My wife and I do help out. We do give a lot of food. We donate huge amounts of food. Um, just recently, we donated two truckfuls of food to the food bank because, and again, I'm not saying this to brag. If anything, I'm saying it to inspire some other people to do this. When you're seeing demands on food shortages or when someone's asking, could you help? We have this problem. We have hundreds of families that have no food ready for Christmas. You know, for me personally, this is just who I am. I will always step in and, and help in these situations. But we're seeing these huge lines, four cars deep, miles long outside food banks right now. And I think this is a sign of the times. And you look at some of these cars, they're not old bangers. Some of them are very modern cars. People are dressed very nicely. So this is affecting everyone and it will continue to affect more people as this crisis worsens. And I don't buy into this whole thing of 2021 being a great recovery and anything like that. I personally think 2021 is going to be much worse than 2020. I think we've got a lot. The, the worst is yet to come is what I'm saying. We yes, we've had the lockdowns and all these other things. But all the lockdowns have done is, OK, they might have helped health wise. I'm not a medical guy. I'm not going to comment on it. But what they haven't helped with is economy wise. In fact, they've crushed and crippled the economy and made it a lot worse. And this is a big problem. And the other thing I want to talk about, actually, which is a huge, huge problem uh, during these lockdowns. I don't understand why some of the psychologists or, or whoever advises the government hasn't mentioned this. And this is huge. And that is sports and people meeting together. I don't know how many of you know much of, of the background about sports and games, but let me take you back to, let's say, the Roman Empire. That's probably a good place to start. Many of you may, may have seen the film Gladiator and stuff like that. Why do you think the Romans had these games? Why do you think that other civilizations beforehand had these games? Why do you think we have sports now? It's because of human nature. Human beings are very interesting creatures. And I'm not, look, I'm, I'm just saying this as it is, okay? So take it or leave it. But human beings enjoy violence. Now, not all human beings, okay? I know many of you won't, but many human beings do enjoy violence. There's a certain percentage of the population who do. And that's why you see violent movies. Why are these movies so popular? If people were disgusted by them, they would report them and they wouldn't be in society. But no, the violent movies, the action movies are some of the most popular movies that are out there. Why is that? Why are sports so popular? Why do people stand in the, you know, in, in the stands and they're cheering for their team and they're shouting, they're getting angry? It's because all of this lets off steam, right? It lets out all this 
aggression or upset or anger and things like that that people have. That is the purpose of games, the gladiator games. It's the purpose of sports now. People meeting up, friends meeting up and having a game of football or, or whatever sport. It's because it lets off that stress, these levels of stress. Now, what is happening? We are having lockdowns. And just as I thought would happen, when you have these lockdowns, what happens? You have violence on the street. You have uh, heavy, like, violent protesting. You have looting. You have all of these things going on at the same time. Now, is this a coincidence that this is happening just after all of the sports and all these other things have been locked down? I personally don't think so. Is it a coincidence that these games that have a lot of violence in them are just exploding in popularity and the, the, you know, the, the creators are earning all this money through the shares and the shareholding? Right? No, it's not a coincidence. This is just civilization. This is the psychology of human beings. You have to open things up. You can't just keep locking down. You've got to let people get back into doing their sports or watching. You know, at the very minimum, let's do this. Let the professional sports people play their games, get their tests, whatever they're going to do. Get, if they want to get a vaccine, let them get their vaccine, whatever they want to do. And let people watch the sports on TV. Okay, at least do that. But some places are still locking down all the professional sports. It is just going to make things worse. And I don't think the riots that we've seen in the US are the end. I think it's going to get worse. I think we, we haven't seen the worst that's yet to come. Give it a little bit longer, even give it a year, give it a couple of years. You may see even worse than what we're seeing right now. I wouldn't be surprised at all if we did see worse. And again, this is coming back to what I mentioned at the start, wealth disparity, where we have this K-shaped uh, recovery that we're having. The rich are getting richer, the poor are getting poorer, and the middle class are getting pulled down into the poverty levels as well. And we're only going to see this repeating. As more people are involved in the stock market, more people have second homes, investment properties, and things like that. When these things reverse, they're going to get pulled into the poverty levels. That's why we're seeing these expensive cars and nice suits lining up at the food banks. And the other thing that's going to make this even worse is AI, artificial intelligence, robotics. The companies are just creating more and more and more of this AI and robotics, and it's forcing out jobs. Let me just share with you what's happened with all these job losses that have been happening. A proportion of these job losses have been lost, and what's happened is the, you know, the owners of the factories or, or, or whatever you want to say, the bosses, they've said, well, we could replace this employee or we just borrow money at 0% or 2% like it is right now and let's put some new robots in instead because a robot will replace 20 people. Look, this is what's going to happen. They're going to keep doing this and it's going to get worse and worse and worse. So the shareholders, the owners of these big companies, their profits are going to go up, their efficiency levels are going to go up, their staff costs are going to go down. If you are one of those people and you're expecting your job to come back, do this, do some research, go on the company website, look at the vacancies, see if they are recruiting technicians for robotics. If they are, then that probably tells you something about the way that company's going. Now, let me just touch on the IMF announcement and the Great Reset announcement uh, briefly, just, just 30 seconds on this. But the IMF has just called for a new Bretton Woods. Now, Bretton Woods is basically saying we want to create a new currency right now. The fiat currencies that we have, the money in your bank account, this is no good anymore because we can't manipulate it anymore. There's not really a lot more we can do with it. We're in a liquidity trap. Interest rates are at the bottom. There's no demand for that money. So we're stuck. We can't just keep creating more money. So they're, they're calling for a new Bretton Woods. Basically, let me just explain what this is. They want a new currency. That's, it's as simple as that. So they're calling on this now. This is the IMF, the International Monetary Fund, who lend money to other countries. Right? So this is a warning, and you should really take note of this warning. Of course, we also have the World Economic Forum, the Great Reset. They are meeting in May 2021 in Davos. And definitely watch my video on that. I know it's 
you know, blocked or shadow banned, whatever you want to say, but you can watch it. Just keep clicking refresh until it, it loads. But I do think because of all of these banks and financial, like all the big players of the world are going to be there. All the, the big banks, the financial institutions, they are all there to talk about this green energy initiative. They don't care about green energy. These banks and all these people, they don't care about green energy. Why should a bank care about green energy? They don't. They are there to talk about this currency reset. That is what I think is happening, even though no one's really talking about this. So that would be my theory on it. So overall, I do think that we're going to be going into a bad period as we enter 2021 and 2022. A lot of people don't agree and that's fine. This is just my personal opinion. But at the same time, people didn't agree with me in March and April when I made an outrageous call that silver was going to skyrocket. And guess what? It went up 100% in a few months. When was last time that happened? People didn't agree with me a few months ago when I said we'd see stagflation. Stagflation. People said, you're crazy. Hasn't been seen in 50 years and you're saying we're going to have stagflation this year? You're an idiot, Neil. What have we got right now? Stagflation. We've got deflation and inflation at the same time. We're seeing deflation in currency. Uh, uh, let me explain that. So there's more currency being created, but the velocity of money is lower. I'll talk about that in a second. So we have deflation in some things and we have inflation in other things like food prices. I've noticed the food prices going up. I'm sure you have. If you haven't, start making notes, keep use of receipts and watching this, but you'll notice food prices in certain products are going up quite rapidly. So let me just explain what the velocity of money is, because again, this is a, a concept you don't often hear about. So let me think of a good example. I am an example of creating deflation in the economy, because every time I get cash, what I do when it goes into my bank accounts, I turn that into an asset. And it's predominantly silver, a little bit of gold, but that's what I'm stacking up on is silver in vaults, different vaults around the world in allocation, like bullion allocation, things like that. So that creates deflation and that stops the velocity of money at, uh, let's say, the number one. But if I was to take that same money and I was to give it to, you know, to give the example of my camera, I buy my camera. Well, that company then takes that money and they don't just put it in their bank account. No, they use that money to invest in research and development, to pay their staff and all of the things. So that money goes to the staff. What does the staff do? They take that money and they pay for something. They buy groceries or something like that. They buy a new shirt. OK, that money then goes you know, unemployed and it keeps circling around. So that's the velocity of money. So what we're seeing at the moment in some regards is the velocity of money simply stopping. Either, I mean, and some people are borrowing money at unprecedented levels, but what they're doing is they're putting it into their savings account. Why? I'm, I'm not sure, but a lot of people are borrowing, putting it into their savings account. That stops the velocity of money. Other people are taking that money and they're paying off debt with it. That also stops the velocity of money because you are killing the money that's already there. You are destroying the currency that's already in existence. So what we're seeing right now is that some people, and it's, it's people who haven't been affected with job losses and things like that, they are heavily saving their money. They're not spending it, the majority of them, or they're making about 50% cutbacks, and that's just the average. But some people are saving their money, and that's not good for the economy. The government, the banks, they don't like this because it causes deflation, right? They're saving that money. It's, it's creating a, a number one of the velocity of money because it's not going anywhere. It's not being used. And then you have other people who are creating more debt. So they're creating the inflation because they're borrowing, borrowing, borrowing because they've lost their jobs or things like that. And they're creating these huge levels of debt in order to maintain their lifestyle. Why? I'm, I'm not sure. If I were in that position, I'd be cutting back to the bone all of my expenses. I wouldn't be living in, you know, some central city location, renting an apartment. I'd be moving to the outskirts. I'd be getting something cheaper negotiating to work from home, even though most of us are working from home anyway. These are things I'd be doing, which brings me on to my final point really around debt. And my advice to you would be if you have debt, you've got credit cards, get rid of those first because they are nasty, nasty things. The APRs on these credit cards, some of them 30%. This is, this is bad. Get rid of it. 
30% APR, even a 10% APR will cripple you as time goes by. Get this stuff paid off. Get these loans paid off, right? And people say, well, what is the cutoff? What sort of percentage? If the loan, I would say, is 3 4% or more, get it paid off. If your mortgage, 3 4%, get it paid off or refinance if that's easier for you. But the reason you've got to get this stuff paid off is, and again, let me use the example of the UK as well. You got all these fools who are recommending people go out and get mortgages right now because the rates are so low, 3%, 4%. Go out and get these mortgages right now. This is crazy because some of these mortgages are only two or three years. Some of them are five years. In the US and some, some other places, you can get 20 years. Like In the US, you can get a 30-year fixed rate mortgage. These are low risk because even if there's a property crash and you stay there for the next 20 years, the prices will come back, we hope. Just don't look at Japan because their prices still haven't come back after 30 years or whatever it is. But if you take the advice of these fools who are saying, go out and get this two year fixed rate mortgage now because it's so cheap, you are gonna be in big trouble in a few years time when interest rates start to come back and start to rise. Uh, it probably will take a few years yet because there's just no demand for the money and the interest rate follows the demand. It doesn't go before the demand, right? So in two years time, if you take this fixed rate now and you think, oh, this is all great, what if interest rates, what if something insane happened? What if they went up by 5% in three years time? I mean, I don't think it's gonna happen, but let's just say it did. We're in unprecedented times. Are you gonna be able to pay your mortgage? Probably not. Are you gonna be able to refinance? Probably not. You're gonna get stuck with a high rate mortgage that you can't afford and you'll probably lose the house. So you've gotta take the advice of these like gurus with a pinch of salt, it's especially when they're promoting property investment type of courses, right? Come and invest in my course, 5,000 pounds, 5,000, $10,000. I'll teach you everything you wanna know about property investment. Just take that with a pinch of salt because they have a massive bias there to teach you these things because they're getting paid from you doing this advice, but it's not them that carries the can at the end when the rates go up and you're stuck with a property that could be underwater in a few years time. If you want any further advice, like you want some one-on-one -on -one advice from me, again, this is possible. You can go onto my website, you can book a mentoring session. There are a link below so that you can take a look at that, see what's right for you. It might not be right for you and that's absolutely fine. The rates I charge are not astronomical. They're very reasonable, actually. So if you do want any one-on-one -on -one sort of mentoring advice, I'm not a financial advisor. I can't give you financial advice, but I can always look at what you're doing and just give you some guidance around that based on what I do. And second to that, we've also got a forum, an investment forum, but it's more of an economics forum, I would say. And we discuss all sorts of things from controversial topics uh, right through to finance. So if that's of interest to you, the link is again below in the description. But apart from that, thank you so much for watching. Please click the like button, subscribe to the channel, and I'll see you next week. Take care. God bless.